Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Young Musician's Guide podcast. This episode is a very special one. We have Dr. Matthew McCutcheon, who is one of my lifelong mentors, um, but his actual position is he's the Associate Director of Bands at the University of South Florida. So he oversees the Symphonic Band, um, all the athletic bands, including the Herd of Thunder Marching Band. He also teaches some classics, classes like conducting um, and some education courses. So he's got his hands involved in a lot of things there. Before that, he was teaching in public school schools and that's what we talk about we talk about um picking music as a major uh, becoming a, a music teacher and then also talking about hey do i want to take the jump into something else um in terms of like becoming a college educator or going and get my doctorate and making those decisions um so a lot of really good stuff in store in this conversation However, before we get that conversation started, I want to remind you to please uh, help out, help us out by giving us a review on the iTunes store, um, also giving us a like or giving a comment if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, anything that we can do to help us beat algorithms helps this channel grow. Also, please um, hand these episodes off to somebody if you know someone who might also get value out of this. I know a lot of the people who listen to this podcast are music majors, and I know you know plenty of people who are not currently listening to this podcast. And I hope that this is a resource that if you find it helpful, they would find helpful as well. So go ahead and share this with as many people as you can. And if you've got a couple of dimes to spare, don't forget that we have a way that you can monetarily help the podcast on our Patreon. That's always linked in any of the descriptions or on the show notes on the website, akcyouth.com, or in the description here on YouTube if you're watching through that. So yeah, those are a few ways that you can help us grow. And thank you to those of you who have already started participating in any of those activities. I really appreciate it, and I'm very thankful for your support. Also, a quick reminder, if you are keeping up with these podcasts and listening to them as they happen, this is season one, episode six. So with episode six, we're going to take a mid-season break. Um, We're only going to be skipping one week of episodes, so everything will be coming back as normal in a little bit. Um, Just want to remind you, and don't freak out if you don't see any content in a little bit. I'm just taking a break to kind of catch up with some things, allow the audience to catch up with some things, but you know, don't panic. We'll be back. But yeah, I guess we are out, all out of a do. So let's get on with it. This is a conversation I got to have with Associate Director of Bands at the University of South Florida, Dr. Matthew McCutcheon. trips of course during New Year's Day is that that's bowl season and our athletics I, I went to them two years ago and said we had the invitation I'd like to do it and uh, they talked about it for about a month or so and came back and said we, we think this is a great for the university and for the band um, can you guarantee us that we'll have at least a hundred people at the ball game and they said even if that's alumni we don't care we just can you guarantee a hundred people and I said absolutely we can do that um, that's fine and so we knew that was pretty much the one stipulation. Clearly, we hoped and hoped and hoped that it would not interfere with each other um, so we could do everything. But there were two bowl games that did interfere, and we ended up in one of them. <laughs> um, but because we we had a, a big influx of numbers this year, we had 370 in the marching band, I did take a handful of uh, alumni to Rome, but they were ones who were in the band last year when the, when the trip was announced. Um, so we didn't you know, go deep after that. But we were still able to take, oh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like 250 went to the bowl game and 124 or something in those neighborhoods uh, students marched in, in Rome. So we were able to have good, full presences in, in both spots. The only thing, the only downside was that we couldn't march halftime, we couldn't march pregame. You know, we went out on the field and we played the show. And I think it was still relatively entertaining, but I, I would have liked to have been able to march the whole show, but... We, we couldn't do that. But other than that, everything went just fine. Yeah, it would have been a lot over 
holiday break and everything just, to learn no a show to right. and, I mean, and you, write it. And you don't find out where you're going until after rehearsals are over. I yeah. mean, you know, we don't after after our last game, we don't have any more rehearsals, and then it's still another two weeks or so before you know where you're going. You can't. Uh, you really can't call rehearsals during exams. I mean, you're supposed to not plan hardly anything while they're doing that, and then people are at home, and it's just there's simply not enough time to learn a learn a show. So. Outside of that, I mean, you also, you're proctoring, I mean, you're talking about it, you're proctoring exams and stuff. How many, how many classes do you teach here at the university? In the fall, I'm in charge of marching band and symphonic band and um, beginning conducting. In the spring, I teach uh, um, secondary education methods, which is basically band director 101. I teach the symphonic band. And I teach marching band techniques, and I teach the brass and woodwinds methods. Are you still doing concert band, or is that? I once I had the baby, I needed to give something up, and so I've given up <laughs> concert. Band. <laughs> you gave up the concert band. <laughs> I did, um, and which which worked really really well because we now actually have two concert bands that meet at the exact same time. We simply got too big for the stage, so uh, the third band director here does one of them, and the grad students do the other. And um, the nice part is this also gives us opportunity to give um, some undergrads some podium time who are about to go out and intern or uh, and haven't gotten on podium that much. And they can play some secondary instruments they, uh, and stuff. It, it's, it's a perfect opportunity for music education majors to play secondary instruments. Gotcha. And so, so that must have been a head spin getting everything involved with the trips you guys were taking, plus the bowl game, mm-hmm. plus you ha- you know you have your you have to proctor your own exams and all that, and pet bands going on at the same pet time too. Um, so it is mind boggling how much was going on, but we have a wonderful wonderful staff here. You know Brian Brow, who's the third band director, really took care of the bowl. I mean he he took everybody and did all that. Um, grad students were very much involved with the you know, getting the instruments ready and, and the physical aspects of packing up, as were undergrads and section leaders. And, of course, the, the band's administrator is Jason Bumball, and none of this would happen without him. I mean, the, the, the amount of work he did just in figuring out how to ship the instruments over and, with, and the timing, uh, um, uh, it, would, it would have been kind of inconceivable to have even taken this trip under... And um, if, if we had not had him. I remember, so James Madison, when I was going there, they went on this same trip that you guys went mm-hmm. on, but they don't have bowl games. Like, <laughs> they, didn't right. have, they weren't involved in all that kind of stuff, and they still pulled from alumni to come to the parade, right. to play in the parade, right. um, and all that stuff. And I remember just walking through the halls and seeing just huge boxes just for uniforms and, right. and tubas. And that was a big ordeal by itself. I remember everybody, undergrads who volunteered in Kappa Kappa right. Psi being. So I can only imagine when you've got both of those things going on at the same time. I think that, that the thing that the only way college marching bands work is that everybody has to kick in. Everybody has to do more than their fair share. And they have to want to do it. And when you talk about groups like Kappa Kappa Psi and, and the fraternities and the section leaders, they know that they're not signing up for glamorous positions. They're, they're signing up to work. They're signing up to make sure that the band can po- be at the absolute best possible. And they know that if, if they don't follow through, things aren't going to work. So, um, and, you know, one of, the, and one of the big differences between college programs and, and high school programs is that, A, we have older students who are planning, you know, professional careers and so we need to give them the opportunity to do this it, it doesn't do them much if, if I have a section leader in title only and no responsibilities I've actually done them a disservice um, so they understand when they sign up and when they get these jobs that you're, you're going to be working you're going to be teaching uh, it's going to be some late nights and year after year and time after time they respond and it, it really this this is a team effort and if any part of the team breaks down, then it all uh, is in trouble. So why, why did you make the jump from being a high school, middle school band director to college? Oh, was that question. something you always wanted to do? Or? No, I always wanted to be a high school band director. Um, in fact, I've wanted to be a high school band director since seventh grade. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't you spend most of your time in public education at a middle school, or was it just the very beginning? The very beginning. Okay. So uh, I'm, in, I'm in seventh grade, and... 
Charlotte, North Carolina, and I have Larry Wells as my middle school band director. Um, and I just thought he was the coolest person on the planet. And uh, my mother was a choral teacher, and so I, I, I always felt like I had a bit of an advantage because I watched her and I knew what it was like her job. And Larry's son, Eric, was my best friend, so I spent a lot of time over at their house. And so I knew what it was like. Um, for example, if I was going to go spend the night at their house after a football game, I knew what it was like to stay after the high school for 45 minutes while waiting for the last person to get picked up. And when we went to the beach in the summer, I knew what it was like that we would wake up and walk out and, and his father was sitting there working on drill. I mean, I, I, I saw all this thing, and so I felt like I got a pretty good... I, I knew what I was getting into better than perhaps some people who hadn't grown up in, in that. And so um, my undergraduate was from Furman University, and when I, when I graduated, I was trying to decide whether I wanted to go straight to grad school or, or get a job, and I'd applied for a couple of places, and um, I ended up accepting a job in Thompson, Georgia, which is a tiny little town about 20 miles outside of Augusta, Georgia, and where I was the assistant middle school band director. And it doesn't get much lower on the musical totem pole than assistant middle school band director, but that was by far the most important year of my career. Um, I had a mentor. I had several mentors. I had a mentor at the high school, a mentor that I worked with every day. If something went wrong, I didn't have to just sit there and stew about it myself and try to figure it out. I had people I could talk to, you know, sitting right there. Um, I could watch people who knew what they were doing because when, when you come out of a music education program you've got a lot of ideas and you've got a lot of um, uh, observational experiences but you don't have an awful lot of hands-on you know how do you actually do this and I got to spend that first year of my career with somebody sitting right there saying this would work this won't work I don't know if this worked let's try it and it was just in incredibly invaluable. Uh, the next year the person I worked with went off and uh, taught high school and I took over this program. And I think it's important to say that I I believe I had an idealistic uh, uh, beginning in the in this career. Um, Thompson was a small town with one high school and one middle school. Um, we had two teachers, two band directors of the high school, two band directors of the middle school, because frankly there wasn't anything else to do in that town. You could play in the band, you could play football, and there just weren't a lot of other things to do. So we had 400 kids in the middle school band program. Um, it was incredibly wonderful. The two high school band directors came over every morning and helped us teach uh, sixth grade. So we had a, a sixth grade brass and woodwinds class and a sixth grade um, percussion. I'm sorry, sixth grade percussion and brass in the sixth grade woodwinds class, and we split both those classes up with four different teachers. I mean, we can move incredibly fast that way, incredibly fast. It's completely different from one person standing in front of a, a heterogeneous room with all the different instruments. So we were able to take off really, really quickly. Um, the the students were there early when I got to school. There were kids waiting to come in the room. If I left, you know, at, at Four o'clock, I kicked people out. If I left at seven o'clock, I kicked people out. They were just, that was, you know, a popular thing to do. And so um, I learned, I would bet that 90% of what I do at the university, I learned from teaching middle school. Incredibly important time in my career. Really enjoyed it. Um, uh, four years of sixth grade of push, push this button was, was enough for me. And I, I have tremendous respect for people who spend their career doing that because I think it's the hardest and most important job in the profession. Uh, then I went back to Virginia Commonwealth, VCU, studied with Terry Austin, did my master's in conducting, which was an incredible experience for me because I was the only conducting master's student, which meant I got all sorts of podium time. Um, you know, I got one con one piece on every concert with the wind ensemble, and then he, uh, Terry's a very active clinician and judge and guest conductor so he was gone a lot and so I'd get the whole rehearsals and we split the second band so it was um, it, it was real hands-on this is how to rehearse this is you know when you're teaching middle school you know you've got three months or so to, to put pieces together uh, that's a whole different ball game from ha hopping up in front of a, a good college ensemble that's going to play it off the page the first time and then you've got to you know decide where to go after that so I loved my time there. After I finished my master's, they actually hired me to kind of 
teach everything nobody else wanted to teach. <laughs> uh, pep bands, secondary percussion methods, uh, freshman theory, you know, they just kind of help out all over the place, which was a great year. And then I taught at Atley High School, just outside of Richmond, for five years. And um, to this day, I love Atley High School. Just a supportive community, um, wonderful principal, wonderful people, wonderful students, wonderful parents. Which brings us to the question I think you asked of, of did I always want to be a college teacher? And the answer was no. I wanted to be a high school band director. Um, so why did I leave? I, after a few years of doing it, I didn't want to do Friday night football for the rest of my career. And there's nothing wrong with Friday night football. I just that's not what I wanted to do. Um, I we went back to school. We didn't have children at that point in time, so there's no reason to stop. And I could have stayed at Atlee for the rest of my career. It was uh, an hour and a half for my parents, an hour and a half for my w wife's parents. We love the community. But I, I didn't want to stop learning and stop growing and really went back to do the doctorate so I could push myself. I should really hurry up and say that you don't have, staying in one place for a very long time does not mean you stop learning and, and stop growing. Um, uh, and in this profession, one of the wonderful things about this profession is you grow daily and you always learn. You know, if somebody ever tells you, well, I left middle school teaching because I, I had it completely figured out, well, that's crazy. <laughs> you can never completely figure, <laughs> figure this out. But I left because I, I wanted to push, push myself. If I had gone back to teaching high school afterwards, that would have been fine. It wasn't the plan, but it would have been fine because I did love that age. And we got to, for, for the listeners too, I mean, because... It's, it's like being in history class, right? It's, you know, when you listen to all these dates, they just kind of fly by at you, mm -hmm. and you don't really get a concept for the time that's passed. But, I mean, we're talking, you finish with undergraduate, um, so I'm going to round about ages. I mean, you're, you're like 22, 23. Mm -hmm. Then you're teaching, you said, for like four years. Four years. And so now you're like 28, 29. Then you're getting a master's. That takes two years. Mm -hmm. And then you taught again for another, what? how, how long were you there? Five years. Five in years. High so now, now we're in the middle of your 30s. Mm -hmm. You're in an idyllic location. You're right outside a me major metropolitan mm -hmm. area. Richmond's a good town. Mm -hmm. So you've got you've got the amenities there. We which have a lot of friends. People. We have family. And then going... Let's go back to cheese and crackers for three oh, years, yeah. and um, and go get and go to and you guys ended up going to to, ta to Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. So you're going way away from it, from the family. Absolutely. And, um, but it, for a fantastic opportunity, nonetheless. But it's still mm -hmm. you, you've got a you're at the perfect time. You're in the middle of your 30s. Like that's mm -hmm. the time that everybody goes. All right, let's buy a house. Let's be put, making money. <laughs> <laughs> let's buy. Let's buy mm -hmm. the house. Let's put up the fence. Let's get the dog. Right. Let's have the kid, and let's right. let, you know. Let's put away to the 401k. Right. And you guys just went. Now nah, let's 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 push the envelope. Let's keep it going. Mm -hmm. um, was that a hard decision for? i um, because you're married at this point. Mm -hmm. and, you know that's a group decision. Did she go back to school as well, or did she no, just kind of follow should, you? Or? I should I should say that. Probably the single most important thing, part of my career, period, is that I married the right woman. I married a, a brilliant, beautiful, talented, uh, kind, um, intelligent, uh, she, uh, any anything I can possibly say. Uh, and at the top of that has got to be supportive. Because where we were, and, and in fact, we went to Virginia Commonwealth University because from, from Georgia because... She wanted to be close to her, to her parents. You know, uh, we had gotten married down, moved down to Georgia, it was a long way away from anybody, and and I told her that we would look at schools in in Virginia. So we went back. We were in a terrific location. Um, she was interpreting sign language interpreting at a an elementary school at that point in time. A job she very much enjoyed, and she could have had she said no, I don't want to go. We would not have gone. And we've made lots of lots of moves, and and she is just completely supportive, um, and has been from day one. And I'm not completely sure why. I'm just really really fortunate about this. <laughs> so we came down to Tallahassee. Uh, she had been interpreting in an elementary school, and the only job she could find was to interpret in a high school. Well, that was tough. Um, uh, my my poor wife had had gone to a, a small Christian high school and and Furman University, and 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 not really been in a in the midst of a, an American public high school and heard the language and seen kind of how they talk to each other. So that was pretty shocking for her. Um, and from there, she got a job at Florida State working in college education. That worked out really well. 
but yes, she, uh, I have been able to do what I've been able to do simply because my wife has been incredibly supportive every step of the way, has you know bounced around from job to job, um, has encouraged me to do these things. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have to talk her into it. I, I she, um, she just knew that you know I still had a lot to learn, and I wanted to go back to school to learn it. I should say this too. I still have a lot to learn. <laughs> I'm pretty much out of degrees, but one of the nice things about teaching in the university is there's still so you're surrounded by people who know more than you do, so you can learn on a daily basis. But um, you know, this is something we don't talk about very often in, in music education classes or whatnot. But choosing the person that you're going to spend the rest of your life with, choosing the partner will go a long way towards your happiness and your, your health and um, your satisfaction at home and with the job. Because when you, when you go home after a tough day, you need somebody who will, will listen to you, whether they understand what you're doing or not. Um, and you need to re reciprocate that. And you, know, you need to be the spouse that you want to have. But I, I would credit the vast majority of, of my career successes to being married to the right woman yeah it's hard to a lot of musicians who especially because she's not oh she is well, she but she's, she's, she's not a like a music major but she is not a, a music professional yes exactly so and you know when you're when you're outside when you're when you're outside of all that stuff when you come home man it, it's really it's really the one of the more difficult things about it is feeling like a nuisance to you and like just feel like no i'm sorry well, i'm imagine I, I am working i swear and you know all that imagine this and, and i was i was bad about this she uh she was a music major she was a singer so she understands but she was not a band person so you know when we were young and i was uh working too much too too long too hard and I would say, okay, rehearsal's going to be over tonight at 7.30. And she'd say, great, I'll see you at 8 o'clock. Yes, absolutely. Well, it makes no sense that rehearsal ends at 7.30, and then uh, you take 15 minutes to pack things away, and then you walk out in the hall and you talk to a kid for 20 minutes, and then the parent stops you in the, in the parking lot, and you don't get home until 9.30 or 10. That, I don't know that there are other professions that actually do it that way. Um, and I don't know that we should do it that way. I mean, there's a lot that goes outside of our, uh, outside of what we plan the day to be, and relationships with the students, with the parents, and with the faculty. I mean, that that's crucially important. Um, but I certainly was guilty earlier in my career of um, spending more time at work that really I, I should have come home, or better yet, and this was the bigger mistake, I could have picked up the phone. And just said, I'm going to be 15 minutes late, but I would get so enraptured in the conversation or something that I, that I would forget time. So, you know, those are those are young person and, and young career mistakes that if I could go back and do over again, I would. And I also say that one of the things that when I came back and, and did the doctorate um, that I was pretty intent upon doing was that if I went back into the classroom, I was going to do things differently. I, I, was, I was not going to get there super early every single day and I was not going to leave late every single night um, there are at the beginning of your career it, you really do dedicate an awful lot of time to, to learning this but I was beyond that point there and I kind of it seemed like when I first started teaching the people I admired were the ones who were always doing band and, and every weekend and, and as I got older, the people I admired were the ones who were coming home and having family dinners and who were taking weekends off to, to spend not doing band and, and, and protecting the mental health and the physical health um, because I just think that's much, much more sustainable. It's, it's like the student who goes into the practice room and brags about having practiced for six hours but it's very difficult to tell what they've actually accomplished as opposed to the student who walks into the practice room for 30 minutes with a clear set of goals and objectives and walks out better you know, than they were when they walked in. Um, this job takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of sacrifice. But many of us uh, overdo it and, and forget to put the time in at home, and I was certainly guilty of that. 
uh, when I was younger, and I think I'm much better about it now. Yeah, don't forget you. You are a human being. <laughs> right. Well, uh, you've, you've got to exercise, uh, and if, if you go to work from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock every single day, when's that going to happen? Uh, if, if you're grabbing dinner at McDonald's every single time because you're rushing to get somewhere, when where's, where's the health going to happen? Uh, there are a lot of people in this profession who do really, really well for four or five years and then uh, are burnt out and, and are gone. And a big part of longevity is taking care of your physical, emotional, spiritual um, family needs as well. And it's, do you feel like, because in university, especially music ed, um, but almost any music degree, I mean, do you, we're, I remember like Mondays here being at USF, being in, I remember like it was like class at 8 a.m. and then you would go and go and go and go and go and I wouldn't get home until 10 p.m. not having eaten and I mm -hmm. still have school work to do and coursework to do and in between all those times I'm getting in practicing and I'm getting in, you know, writing the papers or reading the thing or whatever it is, all these sorts of things. Do you feel like you, you your four years in music school kind of set up for that for that mentality when you get out as well because that's the life you've kind of lived in your professional music career? That's a real good question. You know, we do a lot of our music education classes, for example. They start at 7.30 or 8 o'clock, and I'm completely in favor of that because if you can't get up now, <laughs> uh, then the chances of you getting up and being productive, you know, once you're actually out, out there works. In many ways, yes, I think that uh, a music education degree with all that it entails is very good training um, for what your what your life is going to be. What I don't think we do enough of in the music education or uh, training is to say, "Hey, did you go to gym today? Hey, how? When's the last time you read a book? Hey, did you? Um, uh, when's the last time you went and looked at a great piece of art? I mean, we, we concentrate obviously on music, 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 and we know there are other things that people are taking the GREs and uh, general education classments and things like this. But um, mu teaching jobs are intense. Teaching jobs take a lot of time. Teaching jobs take a lot of energy. And it's part of our responsibility to, to, repair, to prepare people for that. Another part is to say, what's your hobby? What what do you do when you get away from music that rejuvenates you? And, and to encourage that too. And we should probably do more of that. Yeah, and it's... Because what we really want to do, <laughs> what we really want to do is not make you a great teacher the first day you walk in the classroom. It's what we really want to do is set you up for a career in this. 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and, and that's all about pacing. Because it, it does seem like no other major is that intensive in terms of time like that. The only, I, the only way I can answer this, that, because I've only ever been a music major, but I do remember as an undergrad um, coming back to the dorm room six or seven o'clock at night, and everybody else in our hall seemed to be finished for the day, and they were all, you know, hanging out together or playing video games or whatever they were doing. Uh, and I was grabbing something to turn around and go back to the to the music building for another rehearsal or something along those lines. Which I think maybe should should sort of do a segue into who should be a, a music major. Um, uh, I get I, I I'm very lucky and get to do a lot of honor bands and guest conducting and in, in, in high schools all the time. And and we talk to students about. What, what it's like to be a music major and what to expect. Um, and like I think pretty much any other major, what you find is we start a lot of music majors and graduate considerably fewer. And that's true, you know, that's not just a USF thing, that's true everywhere. Um, and I think that a big part of the reason is that an awful lot of people major in music because they fall in love with the activity of music. They fall in love with marching band they fall in love with um going on the trips they fall in love with being in the band room with your friends before and after they fall in love with uh uh getting superior ratings at solo and ensemble or, or large or whatever i mean all these things that that we do and that's great all that stuff is important and the activities of music are, are 
tremendous amount of fun and, and rewarding. Um, the ones who are going to make it as a music major need to fall in love with the art of music, not just the activity. So, um, you know, if, if somebody's coming in and I say, you're also going to learn the history of music and you're going to learn music theory, sort of how this works, and you're going to learn uh, to play keyboard. If you think, I don't want to do any of that stuff, I really just want to be a marching band director, this isn't this isn't the right field. You should be a marching man. And then when you graduate, you should tech at a marching man. And you should make sure your children are in marching man. And you support it the financially. Activity is all, like you said, the activity is always there. Activity every, is Every community is has a community band or you orchestra. Can, or you can be in the church. Or you can create these groups If it is yourself. the activity you are in love with, I am 100% in favor of that and very glad it happens. Absolutely. Continue doing the activity. Um, but if you're going to be a, a music major, performance, education, anything along those lines, you really need to be fascinated by how music works. Um, I'll, I'll tell you this, when, when we have uh, master's students come back, um, what a lot of master's students want to do is to come back and, and work on the things that they're, they're good at. And in performance, you know, that, that makes sense. I, I'm a... I'm going to be a euphonium performance major. I'm going to come back and play euphonium, euphonium, euphonium. But even to that extent, if you come back and play the pieces you already know, and uh, you're, what, what's what's the point? You know, uh, in, in music education, if you're a percussionist and you come back to do a master's in conducting or education, you should play percussion because you probably haven't very much. But you should also take some bassoon lessons. Or, or work on the things that you're not strong. That that's how you'll be better. If you if I when I came back from my master's degree at Virginia Commonwealth, if I had just uh, played percussion the whole time, I, I I would have been I would have learned nothing more about how the flute worked. I I, I wouldn't have known how to speak to violinist. Um, my example for this is when I went to do my doctorate at Florida State. I took oboe and bassoon lessons and I told uh, and I took from doctoral students and I told them both that nobody's ever going to hear me play oboe or bassoon that's not <laughs> the point um, and I don't even really care to get good at this I just want to understand how they work and I need to know how to speak to bassoonist because in you know in many ways they speak a different language um, than, than the percussionists do so uh, the 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 music majors who, who make it are the ones who are really interested in in music the ones who don't make it are the ones who just really love the activities involved and then in terms of music education i mean there's so many my entire studio is full of kids who are who and from this conversation it doesn't seem like performance was like you enjoyed performing and you always talk about mm -hmm. it and, and you still perform mm -hmm. from time to time and um and it doesn't seem like that was ever a track that was like that's that's where I'm going. You were music ed wholeheartedly all the From way through seventh grade. I mean, how many students do you know who are coming in and they're kind of I don't want to do this or that or well, and so this always this always seems strange to, to students when I when I tell them this. I think that if you are, in, in my opinion, if you are balancing between chemistry and music, I think you should major in chemistry and I think you should just do music for fun. You know, you can come, you can play in all of our ensembles. If you come and, and are, are the best trumpet player at the audition, they're putting you in wind ensemble, whether you're a music major or not. Um, that, that doesn't matter. Um, but music, music is a jealous major. Um, most of the other majors, it seems like you can finish for the day. In music, you can't. And so when you're really trying to, to balance, um, balance the two, it's it's hard to do because one of them is is unrelenting. And so, if they de so they decide to be a music person, like if they decide they're going to major music, what? And but they're like, you know, I kind of think I want to teach, but I also kind of think I want to perform. You know, what do you what do you tell those students? I mean, I was that way coming in here. Right. That's exactly who I was. When in my ideal university setting. Everybody would major in music education and be expected to play like a performance major. And that's what I felt like at Furman, you know, the expectations were on us. Um, we had a handful of performance majors, but not many. Um, and, and I should also say this, I don't, 
I, it's not because I believe that everybody should be a band director or an orchestra director. You know, I, I if if I think one of the worst things to do is when people major in music education because they don't know what else to do. Or I really want to perform, but I'm not quite good enough, so I'll, I'll do music education. That'll, that'll be, if you're settling for music education, go a different direction. It's not a settling job. Uh, you probably won't be very good at it. You won't be happy. Your students will suffer because of it. Music education um, is a calling, much like the ministry is. Um, which is, you know, I grew up with two grandfathers and a father in the ministry, so I heard all my life about the calling, the calling, the calling. And I, I think I've always felt that music education was my calling. But when I was an undergrad, um, it was a smaller school, so everybody played in everything. You know, I played in five, six ensembles a semester. And there was no differentiation in there between those who were music performance majors and those who were music education majors. Everybody was expected to play well. And I, I think it's a real um, disservice when people expect their music education majors to play, um, to be less musical in their performance capabilities than performance majors. Once you move into master's, doctoral degrees, it, that's certainly different. It's when you get more specific. Right. You, but, but, but as an undergrad, um, and, and so you say, well, if you don't want people to be band directors, why should they major in music education? Because you learn so much. You learn leadership skills. I mean, we'll take people who are very, you can't really make it through an internship without learning how to stand up in front of people and, and speak. Um, uh, anything that, that you can do as a musician, you'll be able to do it better once you can explain it to somebody else. And, you know, we, we have practicums that people out in the public schools all the time and in class this morning, one one of the students was talking, and he's a wonderful clarinetist, a very strong clarinetist. And he was leading the clarinet section. One, the, the kid said to him, "Hey, how do you articulate better?" And he said, "I never thought about how to explain how I articulate." <laughs> but I tell you, once once he figured it out and explained it, then I bet he could even articulate better. Yeah, it's how how do you? You never think about a lot of times like, too. I mean, I tell all my students who are going out and majoring in music, if you're if you're going to go and study with a person, and especially private lesson wise, and you're going to spend one to two hours in a, in a room with them every single week, and they're going to be explaining you like the in depth ins and outs of the horn. And, you know, there are guys who can play the snot out of their instrument and they can't explain how to play it right. because they're, they're, they have they a God given gift and that's awesome. And they've they, never had to figure out how to play, it just happened. And with, so with music education, I revere my music education degree for a lot of the things you, you were, you're saying. And um, in a lot of ways, every, I felt like when I would get on a podium, it was every single time was a performance. And it got me ready for that. Also, ex like you said, explaining stuff. It also gave me a better, it made me a better ensemble member because I understood what that person in the front was going through and what where their mind was and this or that. And also, I mean, and you, you would always jokingly tell me one of the quotes I tell my, my students when they're like, yeah, I don't like this piece because it's got a horrible blah, blah, blah. It's like, I would hate any piece that you would put in front of us that didn't have a good euphonium part because I would just get bored. <laughs> and then you said, you said to me, well, if you're just looking out for the pieces that have good euphonium parts, you're knocking out like 95% of the literature. And when you get in front of it and you start to score study, you start to appreciate that art aspect of it. And I still get bored with, you know, playing my whole notes and whatever and these things. But I'm, I'm, it also opened my ears. I'm listening for the things that are much more interesting than me. And how do I interact with them? And Right. It makes you a better musician. I also feel like I'm using my music. It's funny because people, you know, talk to me about my career. And, you know, are you, but you're not using your music ed degree. No, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching a lot. I actually feel like I'm teaching more music than a lot of band directors do because band directors are politicians and program leaders. Like, you're doing so much. You're doing the Lord's work. You're doing so much more. And a little bit of that entails you standing on a podium and teaching some music where that is my job. All of that, you know, that's, that's, I spend four hours a day just, just teaching. And yeah, music. You, it would be a big mistake to just say music education is band, choir, and orchestra directors and nothing else. And that's what, how a lot of students feel is like, if I get a music education degree, I'm, you know, I'm cutting my performance degree or my performance out. I'm no longer going to do that. And there are some people who that's what they, they will hit. The education route and the conducting route really, really hard. But that's well, think not. about the things in, in the music education. I, and I've always heard. I haven't seen the statistics, so I don't know if this is true or not. But I've always heard that 
med schools and law schools love to have music students. Uh, why would that be? Well, think what you can do as a music education student. You can go into a practice room by yourself for four hours and accomplish things. What else can you do? You can get in the middle of a 250-piece marching band and accomplish things. You can go in with five people and work together. I mean, it, it's, it's so many skills that I just don't think are taught anywhere else. You can solve problems. And when I was uh, talking to the Marine Corps, they, the Marine Corps loves music students. That's mm-hmm. that's why the Meow program exists. But they just love those people. They're hard workers. They right. have a good attitude. They've, they're so, especially now in today's world where we are isolating ourselves. Music's one of the few places where you you can't, and it also requires patience. And you've learned how to take instruction. You've learned how to give instruction. Uh, hopefully, you've learned how to think critically. You've learned when you're the most important. When you're not, you've learned when to come to the front and when to sit back in the back. I mean, it's it's. It's, it's so much more than can I conduct Lincolnshire Posey. So uh, I, think it's a, I, I think it's an incredibly important degree. So to, round, to now make it full circle, just to kind of keep going through things, so why, why make the jump from a classroom to a college? Why, why did you decide? I mean... You were saying that Friday night yeah. might not have been your thing, but you, I mean, to be fair, and to also you know play devil's advocate for the conversation, you did trade in Friday night football for, for Saturday. Saturday afternoon well, football. I, I should say this too: that wasn't the plan. <laughs> <laughs> it really wasn't. The plan was was uh, not to do athletic bands, and if I was going to do them, to do them for three or four years and then you know move away pretty quickly. Um, I've just finished my eighth year of of marching band here. Uh, I. I love the students that I get to work with. I love the staff that I get to work with. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, one of the problems that so many people make, and this is from the lowest to, to, the, to the highest, is hopping around and jumping around, and I'm going to do this for four years, and I'm going to do this for four years, and I'm going to do this for four years. Whenever I have left, it's, it, it hasn't been on a time frame. It's been, okay, now I feel like I'm... It's time for the next thing, and when that happens, um, when that happens, uh, it will be time to go do something else. But so far, I've been blessed with wonderful students. I've been blessed with a, a program that's that's grown from 220 members to 370 members. We've had um, administrators in the athletic department who have been extremely supportive of what we're trying to do here. Um, great colleagues here. Um, so, so it was not my plan to do. Saturday football, um, but Saturday football is also different from Friday night football. <laughs> it's very different. It's yeah. also, I mean, I felt I feel like you're not calling quite so many of the the actual action shots. No, and that that's the point. <laughs> that's I mean that that's the whole point. I, I I've got a, I'm working with a whole bunch of students who are absolutely com- are capable of doing that, and my responsibility, you know, in, in high school, my responsibility was to to make sure everything was happening exactly at the right time, my responsibility now is to put the right people in the right place and let them do what they need to do. You yeah, know, I, always, I, I have very specific jobs that I, I need to happen. If I don't take care of this, it's not going to work. Um, but a big, big, big part of my job is to make sure that my students are walking out of here prepared for their jobs. I always equated the difference between the two is like being in a kitchen... For and having like a house party, like a guest party, and cooking the entire meal, serving mm-hmm. the entire meal, and all that, and keeping up with everybody's drinks and all that kind of stuff, is like that's the what we we're calling in this conversation the Friday night football. Mm-hmm. And then the Saturday is like you're a manager of a restaurant, right. and you're not you're not serving, you're not you know the hostess, you're not the bartender, you're not the, the but you are wrong. you know how to go in there and help out whoever right. is having a problem. Um, but for the most part, hopefully you can just eagle eye everything and just. Right. In high school, I stood right beside the drum majors. I told them what to play. I told them when to play. At the university, we uh, put strong people in that position. You, of course, being one of them, who was terrific, and we let them do their job. And that comes sometimes with making the wrong calls. That comes, you know, uh, we've been we have, we've never gotten a penalty called against us for playing in the wrong place. Uh, but sometimes we play the wrong tune or or sing on the first down when it wasn't or something along those lines. Nobody likes making those mistakes, and you rarely make them twice. 
So uh, that's, but that's life. That's teaching. That's preparation for what it's going to be like when you when you walk out of here. So, what what advice would you give to a you know a younger person who is who is considered you know like what you said of considering this or that where how do they what are the things you say to a younger person to help them decide if music's where they want to go number one take lessons number two or perhaps one a if at all possible take piano lessons (laughs) um uh if it'll help with every single aspect of, of musicality and learning music and learning theory and whatnot. But um, I, I think the, the big thing is that you want to be in, in a band director because you loved playing tuba in your marching band. That is a great start. It is only a start. You know, um, you have got to... Do, do What music do you listen to? Do you only listen to popular music? Do you only listen to music that you like? Um, do, you, do you ever intentionally put on tunes that you know you don't like just to see if you can stretch it? Uh, how often do you listen to band music outside of band? You know, and we have this with, with even our, our uh, students who are planning to be band directors. Do you actually like band music? <laughs> you know, do you ever listen to Granger just because you feel like listening to Granger? You know, do you listen to Kelly? Uh, while you're walking to class. Um, do you listen to Respighi? Do you listen to Brahms? I mean, do you have a much broader idea of, of, of what's out there? Um, I, I tell them to, it's a really good idea to really try to watch their directors closely and see what they're actually doing. You know, pay, pay more attention than just the 45 minutes you're in class. Um, as far as selecting a college, um, I tell them that the band director is not that important, the football team is not that important, um, that what they should absolutely do, and this is my opinion, uh, the private teacher is the most important part of that decision. He is the person, he or she, the person that will make or break their week every single week. Um, uh, This has been so much easier now with the internet that you can just find all these teachers and, and email them and ask questions. and if. If they don't email you back, well, there's there's part of your answer it says already. Says a lot about them. Yeah. Yeah. If, if if you've you know you don't want to bother them, but if you send a, an introductory email that says hi, um, my name is so and so, and I'm interested in coming to study at your university. Can we meet? Well, if you never hear back from them, <laughs> find somewhere else. Um, and and it's best, if at all possible, to to set up a lesson before the audition. Uh, audition dates are you know. A little synthetic and, and trying to move people through really really quickly and everybody's doing the best they can but you can't tell that much from you know 15 minutes and in a room but if you can go in uh, a month before have an audition spend a half an hour an hour talking to them actually here's what I'm good at here's what I'm not and then they say I want you to work on this thus and this when you come back for your audition a month later and can do that or have shown improvement then all of a sudden you're teachable you know and I know something about you um, when should you start? As early as you start thinking about it. You're a sophomore in high school and you think you might want to go to USF and play flute? Email Dr. McCormick. You know, come to our flute fairs. Come to our summer camps. You know, and then next year, go to somebody else's. That's, you know, you, you want to make an informed informed decision. Um, but I do believe that the single most important part is, is your private teacher. Yeah, it was, I mean, that's how I came here. I wanted to study with, with, with Jay. Jay Humphrey, was, yeah. Was, He's, he's as good as they come anywhere. Um, um, it's terrific. And I, it was through, you know, it was through Festival of Winds, and I had I had just moved to Florida, and you know, down here it's it's all Florida State, Go Gators, the sure. U, and all that kind of stuff. And this was, I mean, USF was nothing at the time compared to what it is now. I mean, I think this was even before you had gotten here, and it was. You know, I went to Festival of Winds, and then just hearing Jay speak in a master class. Yes. And I went, oh, I like this guy. And I was done. I was sold. I, there were two universities I wanted to go to at that point. And it was a similar thing. I went to Parade of Champions at James mm-hmm. Madison, saw Kevin Stee speak. I was like, done. These are the guys I want to study mm-hmm. with. And funny enough, I have degrees now for both of these guys. My, my master's degree was incredibly similar. I, my wife wanted to go back up to Virginia, so I was looking at Virginia schools. 
and I went up to audition at one that has a wonderful reputation, and um, I didn't like it really at all, did not hit it off with the director. Um, nobody's fault, just wasn't a good match. And I came home and I called my mother, who was living in Virginia at that time, and said, Mom, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going there. And she said, well, what about, what about VCU? And I'd never heard of VCU. And I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. She said, let me try to get the band director's phone number and see if they'll talk to you. And I called him up, and Terry Austin talked to me for 30 minutes. You know, uh, spent more time with me on the phone than the other guy I had when I'd flown up there. Uh, and I was just a, a middle school band director in, in Georgia he had never heard of, and, and he immediately took a personal interest in me. And that made all the difference in the world. So it, it, you really are, you know, everybody knows this, but music, a lot of music is about relationships. And... Um, and you really want to have a, a strong one with your private teacher. That's important. And they they will. Uh, I was just telling. I mean, you've, we've got a student coming here to audition, and he was asking me about Jay. And I said, my big my the thing I liked the most about Jay. He was talking about his pedagogy and how he talks about breathing and all. He mm -hmm. was getting into the ins and outs of it. But I was talking about, you know, my favorite part about Jay is he is probably the biggest fan I've had outside of my mother. Mm -hmm. And he oh, yeah. and and he will push for me. And then, but I came here for that. And then. I didn't realize the other things that were here for me. I fell in love with the Herd of Thunder and the symphonic band and the wind ensemble mm -hmm. and, you know, listening to Weedrick talk about conducting yes. and music and, and yes. hearing Dr. Williams talk about, you know, the extra ordinary things and his ideas on music yes. education and, you know, talking to Jason Bumba about, you know, his, yes. his administrative side of things and working with, and, and, you know, nice new build. And it was, but that, that was the gateway, like you said, and, and, got me and frankly, if you had not liked, if you had gotten here and not liked Jay, and every every um, lesson had been a miserable experience, none of the rest of that stuff would have mattered. Yeah. And it, that is the that is the closest relationship you'll probably have, because yes. that's the only person who I mean, a lot of their job is to, to see nine people anyway. a week, and you know, or however many they yeah. have. Um, I'm blessed because I'm in a smaller. You know, right. instrument studio I'm not it's not like flute or clarinet where they have to fill out ensembles right. but no that's totally right and so with somebody who's now there you know they're in university they're junior senior or anything like that they're about to go out into the world um, as a music educator they're excited you know what advice do you have for these people who are new to that profession this find things? a mentor find a mentor uh, and you know everybody's first thoughts goes to their college professors and that's a great one but you get in the county, and there's some guy who's been teaching in the county for 35 years, go knock on his door. Um, maybe his bands aren't very good, or at least not up to your level. doesn't matter. He's been teaching there 35 years. He knows how things work. Um, uh, ask lots of questions. Ask your high school director. Uh, if you have... Uh, the, the Internet makes us so wonderful. If, if you're playing a piece by, oh, John Mackey, and you don't know something... Email him. He'll, he'll, he'll write you back. But the, the single most important thing that you need to know when you leave here is how little you know. And that if you stayed in, in undergrad for another 10 years, you still wouldn't know that much more. And you were going to learn so much more in your first month of teaching um, just because, oh, I'm, I, I didn't order the buses. I just kind of thought they'd be here like they always were in college. Well, somebody ordered those buses. And, and you need you need one kind of go-to guy that is your mentor uh, and then three or four others whom you know that you can call at, at any point in time and and they will they will stop and help and what you will find is that band directors are happy to serve in that role you know they like to be asked questions they they, they you know they're, they're of course very interested in their program but people, go into this profession because they like music in general and they like uh, students in general. And, and nobody, nobody gets a kick out of, out of having a wonderful program where two high schools down is it's completely falling apart. It's better for everybody when the high school two down is thriving and they want to help. So my, my single biggest piece of advice for the new directors is find a mentor or mentees uh, and um, ask lots and lots of questions. One of my favorite memories of being in your classes, and it was one of your beginning 
it was like it was I think it was the introduction to teaching music or something one of those classes that they're all I've taken so many now that it's all right. a blur but you it was I mean we we're sitting there it was in the music rehearsal hall which has this gigantic whiteboard and you go up to it and you paint you put a little square in one of the like the top left hand corner and you go and you go this is how much I know about music and then you make no, that's a, how much you know that's, about music. well no and then and yeah and then you make a little bit bigger one and then you say this is how much you know um, talking about you, Dr. McCutcheon. Right. So, you know, you've got like the stamp size square about how much we know and then like a little bit bigger and then you make it a little bit bigger and you're like, that's how much Dr. Carmichael knows. Right. And he's like, this is everything there is to right. know about music. And imagine that, now we take, that's just the music portion of it. Imagine what that whiteboard is like when we're talking about the entire profession of music education. Mm-hmm. And um, so that, that yeah, men, mentors in anything and everything are that's, I mean, here I am sitting, speaking with one of mine. You, you know? don't go into music because you know everything. You go into music because you want to spend the rest of your life learning about it. So, with, so now you, I mean, you've got, you've got a lot of irons in the fire. Out, even just outside, I mean, Baywinds is function. Mm-hmm. It, it is, it is taken off in an amazing mm-hmm. way. And it's, it's so, it's so great to see, you know, my kids ask me what it's like. And I'm like, it's like being in Allstate all the time. <laughs> Essentially, I was like, it's you're gonna play really good lit, and you're gonna be around the best people in this county, and we're blessed that Hillsborough and Pinellas counties are fantastic. There's just talent all over the place, and so that's what I tell them. I'm like, you're it's, and then you get these awesome conductors in front of you with this awesome literature. Plus, I mean, Festival of Winds, you've got a big part in that as well. Plus, you know, the summer camps. All this other stuff. I mean, are you working on any projects outside of your university responsibilities? I mean, you also keep in mind that you also are somewhat newly a father. I, still. Am. I have a <laughs> I, I have a one and a half year old at home, um, who is also a big part of me learning how to go home. You know, do do my work at school and then spend a lot more time at home because uh, this one past year and a half has gone by in about two days, <laughs> and. <laughs> Real soon he'll be in school, and then soon he won't want to be around me, and uh, so working real hard to enjoy all that. So he certainly takes it the uh, the, the majority of time. Uh, I'm also on the NBA's William Ravelli um, Composition Contest Committee. I, that's what I did my dissertation on, and I'm, I'm running the contest this year because the guy who normally does is in Japan. But that's a great way to you know hear all sorts of new pieces uh, that get sent here, and we take it down to. We'll probably get 40 to 50 pieces submitted. Then we'll have a committee here that will determine what eight to take to Midwest for the final vote. Um, I spent a lot of time in high schools and middle schools working with with, uh, teachers as they're getting ready for MPA and then as they're just getting ready for anything. I, I like band directors. I like people who have decided that this is, you know, they want to dedicate their, their lives to students and, and to music and to the advancement of this art and so uh, I am very happy whenever anybody asks if I'll come and work with them and if I can fit my schedule I always will. Uh, here, here's the thing, uh, if you ask me to come and help you out the two days before your performance there's very little I can do. If you ask me a month before they even know all the notes and, and maybe we haven't quite got all the way through the third piece yet I can be more helpful then. And people are, don't want to have us out at that point in time because they don't want to feel embarrassed that maybe they don't know it all yet. That's when we should be coming out. Do we, so do they, do they call you out to help the ensemble or do they call you out to reaffirm the things that, that they've already worked that, on? That, <laughs> that's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> they're, they're absolutely, and, and I thought sort of when I, when I first started doing this, I was thinking, okay, it's the older guys just want me to tell them how good they are, and the younger guys, it, I was wrong about that. It's not about age. There are, there are absolutely people who just want you to say, if you're doing great, you know, going to be a superior, no problems. And there are very strong, very strong directors with wonderful programs who really still want to learn, which is why they're very strong directors with wonderful programs. You know, they don't need me to tell them how. They know their strengths. They know their weaknesses. They know what's going well. They know what's what's not. They're they're looking for this maybe one little thing that they missed, and that's a lot of fun. Great. Well, I mean, 
I'm not. I'm never going to be able to schedule enough time with you to talk about all the things that I could get out of you. Um, is there? So, if anybody has any questions for you or wants to get a hold of you, or wants to learn more about the university or the Herd of Thunder or anything mm-hmm. like that, um, what's the best way to reach you by? Uh, email McCutcheon, M C C U T C H E N, at usf.edu. And really um, and you and I'll, I will also I'll link that email down in the list below, as well as links to um, the USF School of Music website. And um, how about the Bay Winds? Put Bay Winds. Bay Winds will go down there. Also, Herd of Thunder will go down there. Right. Um, anything else you want to throw in there while we're at it? Oh, I think everybody, all good. of all the organizations you're involved with, also have social media accounts. If anybody wants to see what you guys are up to, right. I'll also put those in there down below. Right. Um, they're doing. I mean, just so Hillsborough County. There's so much awesome stuff going down here. I mean, it's it's what brought me back to yeah. Hillsborough County. Well, we we're very fortunate you did. I was afraid when you took off to Virginia, we might not see you anymore. And then uh, uh, I'm glad to have you around here. You are a wonderful voice for not only what music education uh, is, but for what music education can be. You know, you're, you've decided not to do the classroom. I still think he's going to end up in the classroom. I should say that again. I still think he's going to end <laughs> up in the classroom one of these days. But uh, the fact through your performance videos and your private teaching and um, – uh, your integrity, uh, your your uh, of shining voice for this profession. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for letting me talk and dealing with the technical issues that we had <laughs> earlier. No um, problem. Speaking about Jason Bumba making things happen. <laughs> yes, that's so. There's so many times when somebody will ask me something, I'll say, "I don't know. Go ask Jason." <laughs> and, Jason, and he knows. Um, so. It, thank you again so much, and uh, you, I mean, guys, this is a re- this was a really special moment for me being able to talk to him. I mean, he and he talks about finding mentors and all that, but I mean, I'm sitting here having a conversation with one of mine, and every single musical decision I've made, if you know, if it was any sort of important, if I was nervous about it, I would always come and talk to Dr. McCutcheon about it first um and there was a lot of life advice that he gave me at in this office as i was going through um so yeah, this this is a very special moment for me and i cannot i'm so thankful that you were able to sit down and have this conversation thank you so much thank you